Hey, good morning. Well, it's evening at this time. It's not morning, but it's a Sabbath morning. Would you please try and sit together so that I feel like you're all over. Just move to the next person, whichever side you go, I don't mind. <laughs> Just uh, don't be scattered. Thank you. You know why I said good morning? Because it's Sabbath. Sabbath is just beginning. And in a short while, we will have the blessings of the Sabbath hours. Please move <laughs> to each other. Even the online audience, I want to invite you to move towards us so that we can spend a physical time on Sabbath. I got some good insight here. I say this one I have to read just before I, began, I begin the message. Did you know that any prayers made on Sabbath are answered on Sabbath? With immediacy, with accuracy, with urgency. And so as we begin, I want to encourage you to make full use of the Sabbath hours. All the 24 of them beginning now until tomorrow. Here is a good quote for you from the book Desire of Ages, page 207. It says, the demands upon God are even greater upon the Sabbath than upon other days. His people then leave their usual employment and spend time in meditation and worship. They ask more favors of him on the Sabbath than upon other days. They demand his special attention. They crave his choicest blessing. Then the sentence I want you to remember is after this. It says, God does not wait for the Sabbath to pass before he grants this request. Can you say that together? God does not wait for the Sabbath to pass before he grants this request. Which requests? The ones you will make to now, today, until tomorrow. I want to invite you to the prayer moment. We call this Youth Week of Prayer. And we have had a good time. From Sunday, talking about money, to Monday, talking about meaning. And then Tuesday, talking about marriage. Then Wednesday, we spoke about what? Mind. Yesterday, we were on media. Today, we'll talk about mistakes. <laughs> three, are they three? Well, I'll make them three as usual. <laughs> so just look out for any three fatal. Fatal means deadly. Is that right? Deadly mistakes. Every youth must avoid. And I want you to take notes to, uh, when you hear those three mistakes. And thank you, Dorcas, for the prayer. And we can't pray enough. Even those of you who are driving and joining online, we want to welcome you. And tomorrow we'll be here a whole day. We have two special messages for tomorrow. One for the AM morning time. The subject is do not underestimate bathing. And then in the afternoon, we'll get back to our money conversation. Till death do us part. <laughs> Let's pray again. We can't overpray and start today's message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every breath that you give us daily and much more the breath of the Holy Spirit that we can be inspired and lifted, directed and blessed by your presence as the Sabbath hours fall upon us. We pray that you will help us as we spend time in thankful hymns, and praises that will also bring our prayers and praises to you. And as we make these prayers, Lord, we pray that you will answer them. As we open this message, I ask for the unction and blessing of your Holy Spirit to teach us and help us to avoid these three mistakes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Fatal mistakes every youth should avoid. Nelson Mandela, the South African first black president and a global icon of peace and forgiveness, wasn't always wise and peaceful as we know him today. In his younger years, as a youth just beginning, he was a fiery activist akin to this country. You could think of certain outgone leaders who would say, Badoma Pambano. And you know, those, that was the face of Nelson Mandela in his youth. He was 
deeply frustrated by the brutal apartheid regime, and this frustration led him down to the path of violence. It was not once or twice that you would lead violent mobs co-founding co a militant wing of the ANC, African National Congress, called the Umkonto. Um, um, onto. I want to sound it as South Africa. Um, there is a click there. Umkonto was his way. That means spear of the nation. He was actually having a whole personal <laughs> uh, army as it were. Mandela's mentor and close friend, Walter Sisulu, was a more cautious and diplomatic leader. While he understood Mandela's anger, he... Walter disapproved strongly of the turn towards violence that Mandela used to like. Sisulu believed in peaceful resistance and he worried that if Mandela continued in violence, it would alienate him from his potential allies and he would not even grow in his career. Well, their differing views caused a significant drift between these two friends. Sisulu was a little older, older but he never abandoned the younger Mandela. He continued to offer him guidance and counsel, even voicing his concerns about Mandela's violent tactics. This unwavering support and belief in Mandela actually played a crucial role. Mandela's fateful mistake landed him into prison. In 1962, he was actually arrested for sabotage and conspiracy to overthrow the government. Now, when he was facing a death sentence, Mandela in prison reflected on two things. One, his actions and Sisulu's counsel. And it, you know, he came to realize that violence wasn't a very good thing. He made a change in his life and he became a very peaceful guy afterwards. And all the efforts he made to pursue e equality and all that was done through peace. This shift in thinking was a turning point in Mandela's life and his fight against apartheid. In fact, I think that worked better. He emerged from prison several years later, later as a leader committed to reconciliation and forgiveness, the very qualities that now we admire in him, though he didn't have them at a youth. It would have been fatal if he continued in those mistakes. While Walter Sisulu might not be so known as Mandela, but Mandela's support, Mandela's growth and change came from his interaction with this guy. Sisulu offered guidance. He helped to shape Mandela's destiny, proving that there is power in mentorship, in overcoming our natural mistakes or spontaneous there is a Bible story in 2 Kings that demonstrates this power of mentorship and ability to recover from mistakes. That story is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. I would like you to turn there and watch for these three mistakes and write them down so that you young people out there, and this is not just for young people, anyone can make these mistakes, but directed to young people, if you can master these three things, if you can avoid these three mistakes, your life will be as illustrious, as good as Mandela when he mastered the ability to be peaceful. Well, before we read the story, a little background, you need to know that that story is in the backdrop of Ahab's wicked rule and a nation that is oppressed, a nation that is hurting. Whenever there is evil in a nation, there will always be cries among the people. Whenever you see strikes and all these economic down uh, declines, there is a problem of sin somewhere. The sons of the prophet living in narrow houses, you must remember, school fee was a problem to them, but the ministry of Elisha as their teacher and mentor and the man of God's power in restoring their mistake was good news. Elisha is a master of recovery. I have repeated this and I will repeat it again today. All things will naturally go wrong. We see when things go wrong in family growth, in family life dynamics, anything can go wrong. Math is low. Anything <laughs> that can go wrong will go wrong. I don't know if problems in your house behave like the problems in my house. It seems they come and stay next to the door waiting for each other. Then the first one knocks. The same day gas in Aisha, <laughs> 
You know this story. Anything that can go wrong goes wrong. So in building up the youthful life, listen to me. This is the statement of this message. In the upbuilding of youthful life, something can go wrong. Business can go wrong as you're trying to latch into the process of profit making. Relationship can go wrong. School can backfire. And then I put in Elisha in that situation. Listen, at the heart of Elisha's ministry is a genuine deep concern, not just for the physical needs, practical needs of the people, but for their spiritual well-being. He ministers to everyone. Check Elisha's life from children to youth to old men to statesmen. You will hear tomorrow, even to servants, Elisha did not send anybody away. He lives to his life. In fact, Elisha lives to, f to, to, to the full import of his name. The name Elisha, I told you, El means God. Yes. <laughs> Yeshia means saves or a savior. My God is salvation. Other ways you can put it. Elisha. His name is like that of Jesus. Sweet names. He says in John 6, 37. Him that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. No one came to Elisha that was not attended to. No one comes to Jesus that he will send away empty. From the woman who lost his two sons over a debt which his husband took to meet financial daily needs, to the widow whose son dies, to the bitter waters in the village, to the food that went wrong in the port, death in the port, you remember? Elisha's memory should come to you as someone who was a fixer. There is nothing that came to him he didn't fix. That guy, Elisha, stands as an, a type of Jesus. He is a prophet that works on behalf of Israel's nation to bring recovery. His name, my God, saves. Elisha saves in precarious situations. I want to bring to you the miracle of Elisha today in the hands and the life of youth. To demonstrate that even though we can avoid the mistakes, in case it happens, God is present to help us. Now, this young man, they lose an expensive borrowed axe head. They were building a house. A normal thing, you will always build a house, won't you? Yeah, you can even be cooking and you burn. <laughs> the sons of the prophet had their own challenges to deal with in their school commonly called the school of the prophets. For a moment, you can imagine, if you reported to this school, uh, maybe uh, those of you who went to schools that uh, were interesting like mine, but suppose you are told, as you reported into the school, week one, the vice chancellor has been taken to heaven by a chariot of fire, and that he has thrown down his mantle and his revision material, and the, the dean has taken over, he's the one teaching his subjects. But he has also gotten his double portion of the spirit. What a school. You know, this school was headed by Elijah before Elisha comes in. All in all, to be a student in the school of prophet was not only a challenging matter, but it was, all, it was also a privilege. Take, for example, the privilege of being taught by men whose instructions were coming from God directly. I would have wanted to be in that school. And I want to take you through an episode, a term, a day in that school. Besides, can you think of having lecturers who can multiply oil? If your lecturer can heal waters. Lecturers who can make iron to float. I wonder what he would have taught in a physics lesson. Wonderful <laughs> lesson out here. Well, the student learned more than being prepared for holy office work. They were not just taught business and administration. They also learned useful trade. Some learned mechanical employment to sustain themselves in school. This became the framework for scholarship. They could not afford money, but they worked and they got a source of a steep end so as not to worry about school fees. These were good schools, a good pattern to follow today. I would have wanted to be in such a school where revelation was an everyday manifestation and miracle was part of the practical lessons. So now we are going to the village to perform miracles. Someone has died and then you are a student. I wonder how you'd have felt if you were a young person in that school. I would have liked to be in that school. As a matter of fact, the lessons were not strict periods taken in narrow classrooms, 
But they were random lessons of faith, and they provided mostly experience with nature and providence. The students trusted not only in their counselor's instruction, but they took these counselors in their training. After all, selection in these schools were competitive based on grades, intelligence, character, and discipline. You would have smiled to read the school's motto. I remember Kanga High School motto, excellence and faithful service. Well, the school of the prophet's motto could have gone something like this, to learn the will of God and man's duty towards God. I just made that up. I'm just trying to look at this school before I pick you on the escapade this evening that demonstrates three mistakes that every youth must avoid. Again, the common courses included, they studied law, I thought you should know. Lawyers here, are you feeling nice about that? They studied law. How to approach God in prayer. That's a study you must make your syllabus. They studied sacred history. How to exercise faith in God and how to hear and obey his voice. Other students majored in music. The school of the prophet, though prestigious, had some challenges. These challenges are common to young people today. One, they had narrow dwellings, small houses, small classrooms, small dormitories. And sometimes those challenges can push us to make these three mistakes which I want you to avoid. As we go through the school of life, sometimes the places where we dwell become narrow. Even if your father has a big house, as a youth, there is a way you grow and outgrow that house. And you feel like this place where we dwell, that's where I will start today, is too narrow. And it presents you with discomfort. We feel a need to expand and grow. We are bound sometimes with that need to make these mistakes. But today, friends, I want to ask you, as we read Second Kings, get me there now, outlines these three fatal mistakes that we must avoid. I want you to write them down. I want to read the text first. Or I tell you the mistake first. Which one do you want? The mistake first. And the sons. <laughs> you won't get the mistake if I don't read the text. Let me just read the text. Which book did I say? First Kings chapter 6 verse 1. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too, what's the word? Straight. Straight does not mean linear. Y is equals to MX plus C. There is no GHT on the text. It says straight of S-T-R-A-I-T. -E Enter ye into the straight gate for wide. So you get the, the meaning of the straight there. The opposite of wide is straight, narrow. The place wherein we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Then he says, let us go, I pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam. Mm -hmm. And let us make, let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, what was the answer? Go ye. The first fatal mistake we want to avoid if you are taking notes is the mistake of failure to manage our needs. The failure to manage our needs. I know you wonder, well, what's the point? The point is if our needs manage us, if we don't learn to manage our needs. Now, my wife tells me of the shock she gets when she joined campus from high school. You see, she didn't go to some of these schools like the uh, school of the Prophets. Her high school was one of those world-class schools with large spaces. She had a whole room to herself, she says, and a lot more facility. Yet, when she came to campus, the university, the rooms were tiny, crowded, the washrooms were foul. For a moment, she felt a disappointing squeeze of life that the sons of the Prophets felt. It's true that the schools of the prophet were not one of those world-class, fast-learning group of schools. They were DEB, community, <laughs> women group. You know, those, you know, there are schools where the name of the school itself can make you fail. Eh? 
even just the name, before you get to the school. So the sons of the prophet were in such a squeezed, narrow school. No wonder the sons of the prophet felt congestion and narrow place. I believe that it's good philosophy to keep growing. Don't mistake me. In fact, I told you earlier in an earlier message, spaces grow mindsets. Spaces grow your philosophy. If your house, you can't walk like for a minute in the same room, there's a problem in that house. <laughs> you must change it. Yeah, you know, there's just something. I don't know. Anybody love, love space? I'm one of those guys that can preach from here. People should love spaces. Yeah, look for me where I go, wherever I go, just look. This is, I'm still just here. Spaces. And then there's space up there. There's something about spaces. When you, no wonder CEOs have, have you seen how their desks look like? When you see a CEO narrow in a, some a small room, you must think, you know, so that it allows your thoughts to wander longer before it hits the wall. That's the idea. Oh, you got the joke. That was an intelligent joke. I am asking you to find spaces. If your mom lives in a small house, that was her house. That's the much her brain could get. You as a youth. Somebody said, if your mother was able to afford a bicycle, you will have failed if you can't afford a doody. If your father is unduthy, you have a problem. You must get and, and uh, uh, be able to afford a vehicle. Is that right? A vit. If your father has a vit, that means you must always expand in space. It's a natural thing. We ought to seek to become more. We ought to become better because God put it in our natural predisposition for growth. A nature to expand and a desire for improvement. I desire an improvement on this microphone. It's going low on battery. It's a natural desire. Natural desire. However, we need a trained mind and a trained heart to manage that desire. Listen to me. The first mistake is when that desire comes in the heart of a young person, they are likely to make a mistake. Listen. In each of us, we must avoid the failure to do what? Manage our needs. What the failure? Failure to manage, I didn't hear you, I want you to say it out there. What's the first mistake? Failure to manage, you want to avoid it. Because it's, it's a long life, it's a lifelong lesson, let me say it that way. Because we will never have enough and man will always be looking for something more to satisfy the emptiness of life. For instance, the sons of the prophet did not ask this prophet, please give us counsel. What do you think about our need for space? They just go hastily to devise borrowing schemes and to alleviate their discomfort. Who told you every discomfort must be alleviated? Listen to me. We applaud their practical approach, their proactive thinking to think up a solution towards their growth. Equally important, I want to applaud these young men because of their good attitude. You see, they didn't philosophize and say, Aristotle said, Students got to have big spaces and then they went sleeping in narrow rooms. No, they didn't complain or blame the system of, for taxes. They, did, they, they worked with their hands. They knew what to do to make their circumstances better. Similarly, young men today should seek practical ways to constantly grow so that they are constantly expanding in multi dimensions, physically, mentally, emotionally. But while solving scarcity problems, listen to me, don't make the mistake. What's the mistake? Failure, finish for me, to manage your what? It is prudent to know specifically what needs changing and what kind of change you need to make in your own life. I love these guys. They didn't say the instructions of the school are bad. Uh -uh. They didn't say, oh, the school curriculums, UCBC, no. It was not inferior. It was not the food. It was not the fee structure. It was the size of the physical structure, the narrow dwelling place. They put their hand on what was the problem. Are you feeling squeezed? Do you know the problem? It might be the mind is the one squeezing things inside. Might need a little bit of some beams from the school of the prophets to erect a few more rooms for you to think. Well, 
it helped them to bring a practical solution to a practical problem. I think they must have taken their teachers and measured and said, according to best practice, one man should have at least five square meters. This is too small for us. They came and declared, the place wherein we stay, ukiongeza na wewe, e place nindogo. Let me start there. Ukikana mzazi. It doesn't matter how big the house is. That place is to finish. <laughs> you don't like my sermon, isn't it? Well, I need to tell you a story when I was chasing my wife. We were chasing, chasing, chasing. So we were many. I hope the many will not watch. <laughs> so she tells me later, you, me had moved and I was hustling and living in my little house, paying rent. And I had started life. She later reported that one of the criteria for choosing me was because I was at least living on my own and I knew I had a handle of what life was and that the other competitors were still living with their parents. So literally speaking, <laughs> the place where they were dwelling was too. But do I need to bring this on someone? You know how it feels. There's just an age you reach, isn't it? You feel like this place is too straight. That's a biblical truth. Listen to me. It helped them to bring a practical solution. In particular, they measured the room. They knew the beams were needed. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. Whatever you can measure, you can understand. Whatever you can understand, you can control. Whatever you can control, you can change. Therefore, measure your needs is the lesson. Don't just you know, go for anything. To manage your needs, you need to measure your needs. However, as needs press, as difficulties arise, I ask you, avoid this one mistake. Failure to learn to manage that need. You need the handle of managing the need. Now let me tell you, friends, youthful transitions, maybe from school into the job place, will bring you to narrow financial days when your mom now doesn't send you pocket money. It will bring you to difficult emotional moments when your support is withdrawn. Your friends are now not there. Frustrating calendars are normal for youthful life. The pressure of education and higher learning. You will also feel the uneasiness of loneliness and the need to settle in a, in a relationship. Everybody else is dating. You want your own space. You want every day's provision. I have come to ask you, Ask God's mind and seek counsel from his servant about the meaning of those narrow spaces and difficult times. In God's school, maybe those narrow spaces, maybe small budgets are the best accounting lessons you'll ever learn. Don't be in a hurry to borrow access. Fine-tune your appetite so that you learn that the thirst only for, you learn to thirst only for things that, that, that satisfy. Calibrate and standardize your taste bud. Not everything you feel you need must be attended to. Are you following what I'm saying? Fatal mistake. Failure to manage your needs. I think I also need to manage my need for a new microphone <laughs> because it is likely to take me off chat when I hear the feedback. Not everything that goes bad needs changing. Sometimes it needs the Holy Spirit to charge the battery. He can do that. Is that right? But if I get help here, that will, that will also be part of managing my needs, isn't it? Yeah, so fine-tune your appetites. Calibrate and standardize your taste buds. Train yourself on contentment, which is great gain upon godliness. Specifically, fit your needs into your provision. As you supplement and augment your supplies by reasonable extra earning from honest and hard work, make the best use of what you have, minimize waste, measure your expenses, control your needs. This is a mistake I have seen and it is very fatal for you. Not every lack, not every narrow Space should lead us to borrowing, should lead us to cutting down Jordan trees, you might actually cause global warming. It might need you to plant more trees than cutting more. There's already a tough economic time around the young people today. You should not compound it 
by the uneasiness and slavery of debt. And I'll, read, I'll come back to that message tomorrow on money. You risk sinking your axe head. Thank you. And so I ask you, please, watch over this fatal mistake. What is the fatal mistake? Failure. Can I hear you out there? Failure to manage your what? Your needs. That which you can't manage will manage you. But friends, Jesus wants to be your counselor in difficulty. He wants to be the supplier of your needs. He wants to keep you from anxiety, from dissatisfaction, from depression. You can trust him and he will keep you in perfect peace. Pray over your lack, young people. Pray over your needs and let him guide your investment. But in managing your needs, differentiate the between wants and needs. And this wisdom should also apply to the needs of those around you. Yesterday we had an interesting evening conversation. If, a, if someone asks you for help, should you help? Well, it requires a bit of wisdom. But at length, I ask you, understand what is priority of any need. Prioritize. Is this important? Do I need a cloth or I need to go to school? This young man prioritized expanding the building. Let me give you the context. A few verses down, these guys tomorrow, the next morning, they are facing a serious security challenge. The men of Assyria are coming to take over the prophet's house and the school. Question, if you knew someone is coming to attack you the next day, will you expand your house or you will build a wall? I didn't hear you out there. If you had a security problem in your compound, will you keep growing the size of the house or you will secure the house first? It's about security. That's true. I have seen many young people make this mistake. I call it the failure to manage their what? Their needs. A young man buys a car and a gadget to fit in at a time when money means something different. He could have used the money to invest did you know that if you put the cost of a VIT, let's put it at today 1.2 million, in a money market account, which I can show you where to get by tomorrow evening before I leave here, at 10%, mine works at 13%, but you can get 13 also. If you put 1.1 million, the cost of a VIT in a money market account, huh? at 10%. Let's pay, make it one million dequera easy. So, that every month you can go to that account and you find 10,000 shillings given to you by compound interest. What could you do with 10,000 shillings? You know, I can pay my bills. I know the problem of youth is, as I hear one million, you do your thing. Nazili loans, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But listen. Suppose I could put my, it's still my money by the way, you can take it away later and do with it something else. But the one million stays there and you just go, after every month on fifth, 10,000 in Meongezeka, just by compound interest and use that to pay for your rent or your everyday's bills. It depends on how you live. But tomorrow I'll teach you, there's a mystery, it's the eighth wonder of the world. Somebody said the compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Those who understand it, earn it. Those who don't, pay it. If you smile, you might be on the side of those who understand. If you are clueless, you might come for tomorrow afternoon. We have a serious financial talk here, and it's going to be serious. So this young man, he decides, instead of investing in generating revenue, you know, as a young man, right now, there are things that are not really a priority or a problem. You can get into a matatu and you're okay. There is an age you can get a matatu, even the body will refuse. The other young people in the matatu will wonder, Sasa Ujama, where was he when people were buying cars? There is an age a car will be a requirement. Now it is not. Now listen to me, friends. The mistake I see young people make is to go into expenses they don't need. And nobody even cares whether they needed it or not. But listen. Listen, listen, you must not end in debt and depression because you want to impress. Manage your needs. Another way is just review the hasty suggestions of borrowing. 
and going to Jordan, ask yourself, what was the object of the large building? Who influenced them? Could it be Gehazi? You know the, the greediness of Gehazi? Okay, I think you remember that. Check who influences your needs. Is it Hollywood or neighborhood? Who influences you to go for a new hairstyle every month? Is it the type of your hair or your bad choice? Or friends? I have come to ask you straight away, young people, consider the result of this mistake in your friends. The lives of many who for the love of money they have erred from the faith and then they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. One of the best ways to manage your needs is to train through observations. Look around those who have made this mistake and you will see lives that have ended in heartaches and stagnation and people who have missed graduation. People who now could not, people who could not manage their emotions and they ended up in toxic wasteful relationship and they ended up in premium tears. Manage your needs. Unajua yu kitu unafeel, master the hormones are raging. Unajua yu song hapa kisumu? Master the hormones are raging ama amjafundishwa yu song. Okay. Those needs, hizo feelings ziko kwa kila mtu. Yuti yu mi siwezi, siwezi chill. Ni wewe tu, it might be you, only you who is doing it. Manage your needs. Those sexual desires can be managed. Look at weddings conducted lavishly at other people's expenses where the whole amount is raised from digital begging and sanitized paupers of WhatsApp collection. Or popery. I'm just creating new words up here. You know, if you're a thought leader, you must make people think about things differently. Digital begging. You know what is digital begging? The WhatsApp group, anybody you've never talked to. You are raising one million for your wedding. Wonderful foolishness. I am here to tell you the cost of wedding in this country is 3,000 shillings plus your ignorance and your pride. The rest that you add after that is proportional to the size of your ignorance and the size of your arrogance and pride. So you go borrowing money, you know, all the jackpot-like contribution, you waste it all on one day. And I wonder where you get all that moral authority to raise a whole one million. Do you know what one million shillings can do? Do you know you can buy a plot and change your life forever with one million? So you collect it and then you swallow it all in one day. One day, one million. Say so you've never even earned more than 60,000. Bona, you must come here tomorrow afternoon. I have a serious conversation with young people here on money. But I came to tell you, manage what? If you can, look around. See those who have messed up. Well, we see them. They waste it on one day's event of worldly, lavish display of their arrogance only to go back to a house without curtains. These ignorant young people were deluded that their house would be furnished through wedding gifts. Surprise! Every wedding guest brought glasses. Alas, their marriage started off on economic tensions and statistics show high divorce among young couples. Chiefly two reasons. One, stupid competition. Two, the fatal mistake. Failure to manage your needs. On the other hand, friends, let's learn from those who have successfully managed their needs. The prophet had learned how to dwell in such a small house and be comfortable. He had learned to abound in much and how to dwell in small houses. Small budgets without borrowing. There, he was not showing discontentment. Involve such expertise in your decision. Elisha was much more than a person who had learned to manage his needs. He also knew well how to do the second point, which is a serious mistake of young people. Write it down. What was number one? Failure. What's the fatal mistake? Failure to do what? And if you want to leave this message today, just, just remove the failure part. Just do the second part. Manage your needs. The second thing, the second mistake, Failure to manage networks. I read back in 2 Kings. <laughs> this is a mistake you must avoid. The second mistake. Failure to manage networks. 2 Kings, I read now from verse 3. 
chapter 6 still. I read verse 3 and 4. And one said, be content. That means permit me, be content, I pray thee. And go with thy servant. And he said, what did he say? You notice I like the verses with this, I will go. Huh? He said, I will. Elisha says, I will go, verse 4. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, read what they did next. They cut down wood. I didn't hear you. Are you reading? You see, I heard of a pastor. He told this story and I picked it up. He was called by the former president to the state house function. And afterwards, the presidential security was so tight and he didn't allow him to walk next to the president. Soon, he couldn't even enter into the banquet where he was invited. After a short walk with this man of, you know, black suit, the president noticed, ah, this guy is not with me. And he looked back. And the president just said one thing. He pointed at him and said, he is with me. And the way opened among the detailed security and the pastor walked and came and sat with the president. I noticed that word of he is with me worked miracles. It's called networks. Being with the right people. But before that, let's look at the project. It needed the cooperation of the sons of the prophet in crafting the solution as well as the cooperation of these boys in cutting the trees but they further needed an expert in their company to which one wise young man says, come and go with us, a prophet among us. And the prophet agreed to be part of this team. Of course, the young men are careful not to make this mistake of missing a mentor and a guide in their life. This is why they have in his company and influence a man of experience to go with them. Still, this speaks to the law of networks, which adds to our net worth. After all, the mistake of ignoring guidance, the mistake of not thinking about people who form our association is one that I see every young person must avoid. In essence, it speaks to the quality, not just the quantity of your associates. I read in a book that was uh, uh, referred to me by my quality network. I think I have very good friends. The book was Compound Effect. The book had an idea called Influence Scoring, where you list six people who are always with you, six people you talk to frequently, six people you constantly spend lots of, lots of your time besides your inevitable family and roommates. Then what do you do? When you've listed number one, two, three, four, five, six, you score them on various parameters of importance in your life. For example, in personal growth, this guy is on a scale of one to five, five. Piety, religion, four. Cleanliness, haogi, one. Character, <laughs> he doesn't keep his word, two. Relationship, he's always jumping from one place to another. Then morals and so forth. Then you add the role like this. The one with the highest, the first two with the highest, you employ them as your board of advisors. So if you have anything, you can discuss with them. All right? The next two, you say they are your influences of every day. The last two, you replace them. <laughs> because we're we'll down. That's called influence scoring. Well, I wonder what you can do with that knowledge. But I want to ask you today, to avoid the mistake, you must keep quality friends along your path of life and duty. This is how Naaman benefited from good company. When he went out to look for healing, he had brave servants in his chariot. Instead, these men were men of conscience, men of character, who called him to reason. They stood in front of the chariot and told him, Master, what if he asked you of something greater? They asked him to think through his health condition. They told him, just look at what he has asked you. Naaman, lose your pride. Find a way to the Jordan healing. They helped Naaman change his attitude. I'm here to tell you, if your friends don't help you change your attitude, you must change your attitude against your friends. And you can write that. That is wisdom distilled on Sabbath evening, Sabbath, as, as Sabbath starts. But woe unto you who add to their chariots psychophants of spineless men and women who cannot show you direction or correct you when you're going wrong. When they just cheer you, kiongos, kiongos, no wana kuwa na kuwa Kiongos. 
They eat your money. The girls, they eat your money. You can see that this girl is living at low morals. They are your friends. Five of your friends lost their virginity. The last one left is yours. If you can show me five idiots around you, I can show you idiot number six. It's a law called the law of influence. Hang around millionaires, you'll be the next one. Is that true? So you soon realize the need for people in every stage of life. And we must not ignore people. By the time you wake up and you've come to this house, you have probably put a dress brought to you by someone, washed by soap, made by somebody else, toothpaste, toothpaste manufactured by someone, food supplied by someone. No wonder the ability to treat people with dignity and respect is the highest of all human culture. Why? Because men... According to them, they are the most important people in the whole world. But number two, for you to succeed, I see young people make this mistake all the time. You come to a place like this, you meet wonderful young men. A speaker comes all the way from Nairobi, you don't care about his phone number, you don't even come to where you, people are talking to him, you, you, you are just on your own. Bad attitude. Learn to manage your networks. Your classmates will be CEOs in another, in another company where you will need your children to go for attachment. Learn to manage networks. It's a skill of excellence that everybody needs. We sustain great loss when we neglect the privilege of, associate, of, of, of associating. Mm -hmm. In fact, this quote, this is a quote from Steps to Christ, page 101. Let me just read it at, as, as it is. She says, Page 101, Steps to Christ. We sustain a loss when we neglect the privilege of associating together to strengthen and encourage one another in the service of God. The truths of God's word lose their vividness and importance in our mind. You lose the truth. She says, our hearts cease to be enlightened and aroused by the sanctifying influence and we decline in spirituality. Listen to the next part. In our associations as Christian, we lose much by lack of sympathy with one another. Now that word sympathy is an extraction of emotional intelligence, ability to deal with people. And Joseph was good at this. He wakes up in the morning and he asks his friend, how comes you are looking sad and you're not sick? The ability to relate with people and ask questions. I have a good friend who is very good at this. And she says, let me read. He who shuts himself up to himself is not fulfilling the position that God has designed. He should. To mean introvert. Huh? Introvert, but malise by learning how to manage your what? Networks. Let me read the last part of this, this sentence from. Which book was I reading from, by the way? Oh, you are following. Which, which, which page was that? Page 101, it says, the proper cultivation of social elements in our nature brings us into sympathy with others and is a means of development and strength to us in the service of God. Each of you notices for the last five, six days, when I finish this lesson, I stand there. Not that there is nowhere else I can stand because I want to interact with you. I want to greet you. Story, story. You want to hear story? Okay, before story, may we never fail to manage our networks. Is that something you're going to do? Yeah, don't fall into this fatal mistake of being closed, alone, antisocial, not knowing how to keep positive, useful friendship and mentors for support. We must cultivate the grace and courtesy of speaking to our seniors. We must cultivate the winning uh, uh, attitude of speaking to our peers and the counseling attitudes of speaking to our juniors. You must interact with everyone in a balanced way. Don't walk alone if you will go far. The benefits of network is so important. When you come to the city where your friends live, call them up, visit them, tell them you are there. It takes little to bless people. Be patient with people when you find them rough and treat everyone with respect. Well, just the other day, last year towards the end, I was conducting a management training and uh, there was this middle-aged man that walked into the class and he was part of this group but he came in slightly late. 
He sounded knowledgeable and he knew a lot in the subject area. So this made me, you know, uh, a bit uncomfortable, a little bit, because he was interjecting almost all the time, making comments on, on, as I was teaching along. And it was an eminent challenge for me as a trainer. Because the class was also composed with people who were just starting, students who had just started the course. They didn't know as much as this guy. So I had to quickly think of how to incorporate this student as a resource and an aid in my teaching, rather than to distest his overactive participation. You understand? Soon, the gentleman warmed up to me, and we were good friends, and he could pick out other cues beyond the training, because I keep adding them in the training, and he noticed that I could... Get, get along some more insights to the, uh, you know, to the audience. So over break time, he came and asked me, do you teach other things? And I told him, yes, I teach. I'm a man of faith. I teach in churches. He said, I'm also a man of faith. In fact, within two weeks, he invited me to a private training to train or to teach a welfare group in which he was chairman. Before that, last Sunday before I came here, he had organized one of the largest training. He is the leader of a very large area of, uh, you know, faithfuls. And he gathered over 1,000 people and he told me, come and talk to these guys. And you've had a little bit of the details of that meeting. It was one of the most successful meetings. But I date it back to how I interacted with this guy. I looked at this guy as my network. And he was, he was not a threat. And we made friends. It's a skill you learn with time. To make this practical, friends, be sure to decide not only where you are going, but who goes with you. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with people, good people for that matter. Have mentors along your pathway, someone who has walked your path. Men whose walking pace are your running pace. I could pause on that one, that's a good statement. Men whose walking pace is your what? Your running pace. Someone said, do not take advice from somebody whom you can't exchange positions with. You don't wish to be them. If you wish to be me, I can advise you. Don't you think that? That's true. So Jesus, I want to bring him quickly because Elisha here represents Jesus. Elisha goes with these boys. Jesus is a worthy superlative companion. He is ready and willing to walk with us. He promises to be with us to walk with us and he will help us. He is the silent companion and he goes with us on our paths even amidst bitter disappointments on roads like those to a mouse. He is always with us. He knows our experience, he feels our pain. When the shoe pinches around, along the path, Jesus is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of need. Take him with you, not just his name, take him with you I, I think, friends, on that lesson number two, I've done enough on it. It's a fatal mistake to take a journey without asking God to go with us. What do you think? Take God to go with you. He understands your weakness. He is good company. The greatest company is the company of God and God's power. No wonder the presence of this prophet with the young people was not just good influence, not just good network, but it brings us to point number three and the last one on this message. Now, before I tell you number three, you must remind me, what's the first mistake you're going to avoid? Failure to manage. Eti ukisikia, ukiona chicken, every chicken you think you should eat, apana, manage that need. Number two, failure. You're going to avoid failure to manage what? Networks. Don't meet people and ignore them. Number three, avoid this mistake, failure to manage difficulty. If you like, you can call it failure to manage calamity. When things go wrong, disappointment, loss, failure. Let me read verse 4 and 5. And that's where I will end today. It says, and one, ah, this is verse 6, uh, I mean chapter 6, verse 4. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down wood. There's a reason why I regress on that verse, verse 5. But as one of them was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Hmm. Let me try this. Come with me. 
to the river Jordan, to the riverside, and see the muscled young men cutting down beams one after another. Listen to the echo and the blow of the axe across the river and the falling of the trees. They were busy doing all they should do with all their might, whatever their hands find to do. I am here to tell you even before I get to the axe head falling, one of the best ways of managing difficulty is to master duty, to be available at your post of responsibility, to be sure you are planting during springtime and harvesting in the autumn. That is why these young men went to the Jordan. It was their destination and their post of duty. Like the watchmen, they stood by the gate. They stood where they were supposed to be found. They didn't go swimming. They were not distracted with tadpoles. They were not distracted with fishing or planktons. These guys had one object, trees. I ask you, cut down trees. One of the ways to manage difficulty is to stay on your duty. When you have done your duty well, chances are that you have reduced difficulties of the day. Does that make sense to you? Train yourself to truthfulness to duty and diligence. It counts for the progress and prepares every young man to overcome difficulty. Be sure, young man, to come to the Jordan of your classes if you're in school. Come to the Jordan of your work if you are an employee and cut down trees. Write them reports. Complete the assignments. Attend classes. Follow through the, the task. Remember, your first obligation is to cut down trees. Be diligent. It's a better way of managing difficulty. Endure hardness like a good soldier. They said good habits are hard to form, but easy to live with. I know what I'm telling you. But bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. Try either. You will be happy. We do not say that those who are diligent will not meet difficulty. We read in verse 5, in fact 6 and 7, that something bad happened. The axe head fell in the water. Did you read that? As one of them was cutting down a tree, the axe head fell into the water and he cried, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Listen to the question of the man of God. So the man of God said, verse 6, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a streak, a streak, threw it in there, and he made the axe head, iron head, to float. And he said, pick it up yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. There is no, I'm going to add something to that text. And took it and continued <laughs> cutting firewood, cutting trees. Well, let me leave that for another day. But let me ask you, friends, as I come to the last part of managing difficulties, can you remember the last time you lost something valuable, but it was borrowed? You know, you wish, I, I wish I, I lost my own. The experience of anguish, you, you wish that it, it, was, it was your own, but now it is, it is borrowed. That's how the, the sons of the prophet fell, f felt on this evening. Well, herein is the heart of our final lesson from this young man. Don't fail to manage difficulty. Don't fail to manage calamity, misfortune, discomfort, loss. Somebody said, man is either out of trouble or in trouble or is getting into trouble. So you better learn the skill, the handle that one day the axe head will fall into water. Now listen, the axe head here represents any means or a tool given to us as young people to help us in growth and expansion. And therefore, the axe head falling in water represents loss or damage to such a viable tool. It could be your freedom as you leave home. It could be your school time. It could be your health. Something can happen. Whether the axe head fell because of negligence, I don't know. Whether it's because they didn't have expertise or improper use, lack of maintenance, degradation, somehow, someday, we all will face the misfortune of loss and failure. Listen to me. Learning to manage disappointments is an important skill. In fact, we have an entire book on how to manage disappointment. It's called Bites of Betrayal. To manage loss, we must first assess the impact of the loss. For this young man, it was the fact that this thing was borrowed. Are you following? It was what? There are things you can't afford to lose. Borrowed things. 
And this evening I ask you, take a moment and think through what things are borrowed in your life? They're helpful for your growth, but what are they borrowed? Your ability to quantify what is borrowed, what is in your care to help you, but is borrowed, can help you to recover in an event of loss. That which is given to us for profitable use must not be allowed to degrade, must not be allowed to break down or to get lost because we have borrowed it. And let me say something. Youthful time is borrowed time. Please write that down. It will help you. It is borrowed time. Borrowed time. Mm -hmm. Value it appropriately. Know its proper use. Take responsibility for its care. The second thing is assess where the axe had fell. Ask yourself tonight as I close this message, where did the rain start beating you? Can you describe where you went off course? Now you weigh more than you should. What, what is the problem? What are the appetites you are fueling outside your budget? What's the bad company you must change after this message? Do we know the areas where we need help and mentorship and coaching? Do we know what attitude you need to change? In essence, we must list where we have failed so that we can get help. This is a mistake that young people must avoid. It's a fatal mistake to fail to manage your failures, to manage your mistakes. Well, friends, we sometimes don't realize that time and opportunity given to us is borrowed. This weighty axe head is handled carelessly until it falls into the waters of peer pressure and it's swept down the current of time downstream. Then the youthful days fleet to middle age. It was your time to manage networks where you'd have gotten a husband, you wake up, you are now 30 something. I think you don't know that joke here, so I leave it. When you had the beauty, you know there's a time where hair agrees. natural, it grows, isn't it? Your face, it shows up. God has made those things to prepare you for mating. That time is borrowed. I am asking you, take seriously your youthful time. Take it seriously. Those days fleet, and you come to the end of your youth without a beam of trees to carry home from the forest, and you are unable to expand your humble, narrow dwelling, and you continue living in small houses. If we don't learn from these three mistakes, we may sadly come to the end of life without our axe heads. Somebody said, a person who misses his opportunity and a monkey who misses its branch, those two people cannot be helped. This young man knew that they made a mistake in following their appetite without counsel. Today I ask you, avoid that mistake. What's the mistake? Failure to manage your needs. However, they did well in bringing a prophet with them. They managed well their network. I hope you noticed that, how it helped them to avoid the last mistake. In their failure, they managed it. They had a godly man with them, and we must have by our side godly men to walk with us, righteous men to stand with us, discerning men to lend us help and sit with us when we are at loss, someone to assist us in right thinking, to support us, correct our mistake. Finally, friends, I ask you, go with God because he can correct your mistake. Have you made a fatal mistake? I want to ask you today, reflect on maybe one life's mistake you have made. Is it the biggest loss? I can tell you the biggest loss is a life without God. Invite Jesus to go with you like this young man. They invited Elisha. Elisha represents the power of God that will restore your losses, will recover your mistake. However fat, uh, uh, fatal, your failures can be covered. It can be recovered. And tomorrow, I'll talk about it. Your debts can be paid. Your sins can be forgiven. The guilt can be taken away. Relationships can be restored. Jesus makes even this promise. 
the years that the locust has eaten, he can do what? He can restore. Would you trust him today? Is your axe head sunken somewhere? Or maybe the person himself is sinking. Come to Jesus. Take a walk with him. Make him your companion. And he will help you in these three steps. I got a song here. And you will sing it. Would you please remind me the three mistakes that you are going to avoid? Number one, avoid the failure. I didn't hear you. To manage your what? Your needs. Number two, avoid the failure to manage your networks. Have good people around you. Finally, avoid the failure to manage your mistakes. Mistakes can always be corrected. Here's a good song that will help us reflect and pray at the end.
Friends, I want to ask you today to take this Jesus with you in every step. And I want to pray that he performs a miracle today to help you pick up your life and continue just in case you have made any one mistake. He can help you to start afresh. He will hear you when you call. He will lift you when you fall. Let's stand and pray and ask Jesus to help us as we live today to stay away from these three mistakes, the failure to manage our needs, that it will keep us from the failure to manage our networks. But the biggest network is our connection with him and that he will walk with us even in our troubled waters. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because through your servant Elisha, we feel your daily willingness to walk our path. And even sometimes when we've made mistakes, you can conduct a miracle and the axe head, even the metal, can float. I pray that this will be our experience today. I ask, Lord, that even as the Sabbath hours have drawn on us, that the prayers that we have pressed upon you according to your promise today to forgive our sins and to help us to start afresh to walk with you will be answered within the Sabbath together with the different needs that will be raised in this house of prayer and even with those who joined online. If there is a heart that desires to walk with you, please, I pray that you will oblige and walk with them as Elijah did. And bless us now, give us rest, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.